Hi and welcome back. In this video, we're going to be installing Python. All you have to do is go to python.org, then hover over the Downloads tab and click on the appropriate version. At the moment, we're on Python 3.7, but this may increase later on. All content in this course works with all Python versions from 3.5 onwards, so don't worry too much about which Python version you're installing. If you're using Mac OS, just click on the installer and follow it as you would for any other program. If you're on Windows though, you may need to change some settings. So let's look at that now. On Windows, the process is the same. Go to python.org, hover over Downloads and download it for Windows. Do make sure that you are using Windows Vista or After as Python 3.5 Plus cannot be used on XP. Once you've opened the Python installer on Windows, you got to make sure that add Python 3.7 to path, this checkbox down here is checked. You do need that for everything to work well, as that allows other programs to use Python. And because we're going to be using PyCharm, that's going to come in really handy. Once that's checked, you can just go ahead and click on install now. And that's going to go through and install Python in your computer. If you're on Windows 10, once the installation completes, you will be able to disable the path length limit. What this means is that in some cases, you may have a file path that is longer than the limit for Windows, but you can allow Python to bypass it, which gives you more flexibility for really no uh, drawbacks. If you're using Windows 8 or earlier, that option won't be there, but that's okay. Don't worry too much about it. Once that's done, you can close and you can launch IDLE. So do make sure you open the Python 3.7 version or whichever other version of Python you want to open. All right, that's everything for this video. Thank you for joining me. We've learned how to install Python and now we're ready to move on. I'll see you in the next video. Hi, and welcome back. In this video, we're going to be installing PyCharm. PyCharm is a Python editor. It's a program that lets us write our Python code and run it and add other files to a project and, you know, do a bunch of stuff. But it's just an editor. It just lets us write the code and gives us a few more pieces of functionality. You don't have to use PyCharm if you don't want. You can use any text editor just Notepad on Windows or Notepad++ if you have installed that. You can use Atom or Visual Studio Code. You can use Sublime Text. You can use TextMate. There's a lot of editors you can use out there if for some reason you don't want to use PyCharm. However, I'm assuming you are a beginner in Python. And if so, I really recommend that you go for PyCharm. It is the best editor for starting up with. It gives you a lot of bang for your buck. It does a lot of stuff for you and it's really helpful. So I definitely recommend that. And also as you get better at Python, you'll discover that PyCharm does more and more things that you didn't know about before that will keep making your life easy. I use PyCharm at work and I recommend it for you too. Anyway, that's enough of the sales pitch. Uh, don't worry, this, this thing is free so you don't have to pay anything. Um, go over to www.jetbrains.com and then let's go over to Tools and find PyCharm here. And notice how JetBrains has a bunch of other IDEs for different programming languages. You don't want to install any of them other than PyCharm, unless, of course, you are doing some work in other languages as well. So let's go into the PyCharm page. And then you'll be greeted with two options. When you, well, first of all, press Download now here. And now you're greeted with two options. Professional or Community. Now, select the operating system that you want. If you're using Windows, then go for Windows, and otherwise select your other, other uh, operating systems there. And then make sure you go for Community Edition. Okay, this is free, completely free software, as in you don't have to pay anything for it. If you use the Professional Edition, that's a free trial. So after a month, I think, you'll be asked to pay. So go and download the Community Edition. That's the version we're using in this course. Of course, if you're working for a company and they pay, I recommend you use the Professional Edition. It does give you a few more things 
particularly as you go into web development, which is a key use case for Python. And we'll look at that later on in the course. But for now, download the Community Edition, install it like any good old normal program, and then you'll be able to launch it. Now, in the next video, we'll launch PyCharm, and we're going to look at joining PyCharm with the Python version we've just installed, Python 3.6. So let's go on to the next video and look at that. Hi and welcome back. Once you've opened up PyCharm for the first time, you'll get something that looks more or less like this. If you get asked to import any settings from a previous PyCharm version, just say no, because you don't have any previous PyCharm versions. Unless, of course, you do have a previous PyCharm version that you want to import settings from. But if you don't know what it means, just say no or cancel or exit. Then make sure you open up PyCharm and you'll, you'll have a window that looks more or less like this, or possibly like one we'll see in just a moment. Nonetheless, what we want to do is go into Create New Project. So let's create a new project. And then you've got two things that you have to pick. The location of your project, where in your computer this project is going to live. And also the interpreter. This is the Python version that you want to use for this project. Notice that, for example, Mac OS comes with Python 2.7 already installed. However, when you create a new Python project, you can choose whether you want to use Python 2.7 or Python 3.6 that we've just installed. Python works fine if you have multiple versions all installed at the same time in your computer, and it is on a per project basis that you'll choose which Python version to use. So you can install Python 3.7 when it comes out alongside 3.6 and that's totally fine. Let's pick out a location for our project. So what I'm going to do here is I am going to go over to my desktop. Okay, so I'll open up the desktop here and I'm going to create a new folder, which is going to be called uh, milestone one. Now my project is going to be in this folder here. So any new files I create are going to appear inside that folder. And basically all the contents of the core of this project are going to be inside that folder. Make sure to pick out a folder that you like. For the interpreter, I have a lot of options here and you won't have so many options. But what you want to go and find is 3.6, presumably 0.4, which is the one we've just downloaded, or 3.7 or you know 3.5 or whatever version you've got installed at the time of this video. Now, the latest version currently is 3.6.4, but I've got 3.6.0 installed, and you know, that's fine for the, for the purposes of this course. So make sure you find 3.6. Make sure you don't select an invalid one. If you have any, select only the valid ones. And we'll look at what, what, why I have so many versions later on. Then you can go and press Create. And, and really, that's it. So a couple of things. PyCharm shows you a tip of the day. These things are pretty useful, and it, it tells you some information on how to use PyCharm. I recommend that you don't untick the box, so that every time you open PyCharm, you get this, and maybe you can learn a thing or two. So uh, I normally do read them. I won't read them today. Then what we've got is our project here on the left. If this was the first screen you saw when you opened up PyCharm, you can always go over to create a new project by pressing on File, New Project. And that will let you create a brand new project. Okay. Then you've got a bunch more menu options, and we're going to be learning a lot about those as we go through the course. So don't worry if you don't know what they do just yet. You've got the usual edits, undo, redo, cut and copy, and so forth. And they can be pretty handy in a lot of scenarios. But then what we've got is our tree. Here we've got our project, project files, problems, and scratches. That's a really bad name. We'll only be working with project in this course. This gives you the project files and also any external libraries that we're using. At the moment, this project is only using one external library, which is Python 3.6. That's the interpreter we chose earlier on. And our project is a folder called Milestone 1, that doesn't have anything inside it. But we can add things to it. For example, you can right click on it and add a new Python file. 
Then you'll get this dialog and you can choose what type of file you're going to add, Python file or a Python unit test. Don't click on that just yet. We'll look at that later on. Just click on Python file and I'm going to call it app. App now is created inside our project. Look, we've got our file app.py and the .py has been appended at the end and that just means that this is a Python file. The name app.py can be anything you'd like, but app.py is a pretty popular name for your sort of main file in a Python program. Whenever you run your program, likely this is the file that you're going to be running. So app.py is a pretty popular name and I advise that you go for that for the main most important file in your program. Now over the next few videos, we're going to be looking at developing our milestone project. But first, of course, I'm going to give you the brief so that you can tackle this milestone project on your own. It's going to be a challenge and you may have to do some research in order to do so. But please do, don't just move over to the next lecture. Give it a go. Try developing this, this application on your own first. And doing that is going to ensure that you learn much faster than just watching the video. So with that said, I'll see you on the very next video. Hi and welcome back. This is a small side video where I just wanted to tell you about this dark theme I've got. I like developing on a dark theme, but a lot of people don't. And I actually just realized this as I was recording the video that I'm, that I'm working on this dark theme. And it's probably not the best thing to do for recording. So I don't want you to suffer through my developing in a dark theme if you don't like it. And for recording, we're going to swap over to a white theme. Also, sorry if you do like the dark theme, because we're going to be using a white theme. But nonetheless, I wanted to show you that you can change from white to dark if you prefer it. So all you have to do is go over to your preferences. And in here in appearance, you can choose your theme. So you can go to default, and that'll be the white theme. So that's what we're going to be using throughout the course. My apologies that the last video was in dark theme. We're going to stick to this theme. Okay. This gives you this white theme. Now, by going back to the preferences, you can also change your editor. And in your editor, you've got your fonts. And you've got a bunch of other things here, like your color schemes and things like that. For the... Um, Sorry, I don't know why, why this is here. For the recording, I'm going to go over to my color scheme font and I'm going to choose a different scheme. There's, there's quite a few and that gives you like different colors of your fonts. Uh, like, for example, Twilight will give you a font that looks like this. Uh, Darkula will give you a font that looks like this. And I'm going to go with my recording scheme, which is one I've created that has a nice readable font and it's quite large so you guys can see it in the video. And so that's how you can change the font, the colors, and the theme in PyCharm, just in case you want to do that before you start developing. Uh, and there's quite a lot of fonts that you can use for developing. Normally, I recommend monospaced fonts. That's fonts where all the letters have the same spacing uh, around them. All the letters are the same size. That just makes things a bit easier when you're programming. And if you're interested in knowing some of the fonts that I like for programming, just feel free to ask. Uh, and, and I'll be happy to, to tell you. Anyway, that's it for this video. Just a small side video to tell you about these themes before I, uh, I make you suffer with my dark theme. Now we can move on to the next video and we're going to start developing this milestone project. Hi guys and welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about the milestone project number one. This is going to be a movie collection app. And in this video, we're going to give you the briefing for the project, as well as a few hints that you can use when you're developing the project. We're not going to be completing the project in this video. That is for you to do before we show you how we would do it ourselves. So everything's covered in this short presentation. So the requirements for the project are normally defined as user stories. A user story is a phrase in the format 
as a user, I would like to be able to do something so that I can achieve something. So the first user story is that as a user, I'd like to be able to add new movies to my collection so that I can keep track of them. Pretty straightforward. The next one is that as a user, I'd like to be able to list all the movies in my collection so that I can see what movies I already have. So these are two different things that our users should be able to do with our application. Something important here is that these user stories don't define the implementation, whether you should use databases or lists and so forth. It just says that a user would like to be able to do these things. Finally, as a user, I'd like to be able to find a movie by using the movie title so that I can locate a specific movie easily when the collections grow. And so that is going to allow us to do some searching. So how are we going to implement this project? First of all, we have to decide where we're going to store movies in the code. Again, that's whether we're going to be using a database, whether we're going to be putting uh, things in a dictionary or in a list or variables, stuff like that. And so where is the data that our program relies on going to go? Then we have to decide what data we want to store for each movie, whether that's going to be a dictionary representing some movie properties. Maybe it's a tuple with just the properties themselves and so on. Once we've decided these two things, we're ready to start implementing. And the first step is going to be to decide what the user is going to see when they interact with our application. So we're going to create a menu and we're going to let the users pick an option out of the menu. Then we're going to implement each requirement in turn to add, list and find movies, each as a separate function. That's how we're going to implement this. And finally, we also have to make sure that users can terminate the program and we're going to make sure that when they type the Q key, the program ends. So these implementation tasks are something that you should decide when you're starting a new project, just broad strokes. It doesn't have to be extremely specific. Here it is quite specific because the project is quite small, but it just gives you some guidance regarding what you want to do and in what order. Let's start with the first one, where to store movies. Normally, for almost any project, you would use a database, but we haven't looked at how to do that. So we're going to store them in a Python list. Putting things into a list is easy. You can use append to add things to a list and you can go over the list using a loop very easily. But the problem is that movies get deleted from the collection when the app terminates. That is going to be a temporary a compromise that we have to make. But later on, when we learn more about databases, we will be able to overcome this. So for now, once we've decided to store things in a list, our code essentially looks like this. We've got a movies variable and that's equal to an empty list. So what are we going to store for each movie? You can decide here how you want to represent a movie in your code. For example, you could create a dictionary that has keys where each key, for example, the movie title or the movie director is a key in the dictionary and has a value associated with it. You could use a tuple where the first value is the movie title, the second value is the movie director and so forth. That's totally up to you. Just make a decision now so that you can then code relying on this to be the structure of your data. In this project, we're going to be creating a dictionary for each movie. And in the dictionary, we're going to store the movie title, director and release year. So we're going to do something like this. We're going to grab the title, director and year from the user using the input function. And then we're going to append to the movies list a dictionary. You can see the curly braces there. This is a dictionary with three keys, the title, director and year. And each one has whatever the user typed. This is just a bit of a hint. It's not quite going to look exactly like this because we're going to be using functions and all that stuff in our code. But just to give you an idea of how we might go about this. The third and final hint is we have to show the user a menu. And for that, we have to get the user's input regarding what they want to do. And then we want to run a loop and get their input again at the end so that we can start the loop again with some new user input. So we might do something like this. Here I'm defining a menu prompt variable that tells the user what the options are. So they can enter A to add a movie, L to see your movies, F to find a movie by title or Q to quit. 
then we get the user's input in this line. And while the input is not equal to Q, that means that we want to run this loop. We want to continue asking the user what they want to do, and we want to do something with that input. And at the bottom of this loop, we ask the user again for their input. If they type Q, the loop terminates, and we stop the application. And if they type something else, the loop continues, and then we do whatever it is that they selected. We are doing this with if statements. So as long as they didn't enter Q, we're going to jump in here. And then if what they entered was A, then we're going to do something. If they entered L, we're going to do something else. And if they enter F, we're going to do something else. Finally, if it's none of those, we're going to print that this was an unknown command. The pass keyword, by the way, is a new thing that we are learning now. And it just means do nothing. But Python requires an indented block underneath an if statement. You can see that this has more indentation. So that's why we have to put something in the block. And pass is the perfect candidate just to tell us that we want to do something here later. We haven't implemented it yet. So you can use that in your code as well. Now that we've got this, the next step is to implement each requirement in turn. So add movies, list the movies, and find a movie. So let's go into the code editor in the next video and allow users to do this. But before that, you should try this yourself. In this video, we've linked the incomplete app in the resources section of this lecture. You can take a look at that code and use it as your starter code. It's just the code that we've shown you in this presentation. Once you've tried that and once you're ready, move on to the next video and we'll show you how we would implement this project. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Hi guys and welcome back. In this video, we're going to be implementing our milestone project to show you how we would do it. But please make sure you have attempted this on your own first. By coding and actually practicing, you're going to learn the most. So just watching the videos is not really going to be enough. Do attempt it on your own first. Once you've attempted it on your own, then watch this video. Compare your code to the one we write. And at the end, if you have any questions about your code or any feedback or things like that, ask them in the course Q&A and we'll be more than happy to help you out. Let's get started. Here we've got the incomplete app code. So I've created my project in PyCharm. My file is app.py and I've copy pasted the code provided in the last lecture. Now I'm going to close this sidebar there so that we can focus solely on the code. And what we've got is the menu prompt the movies list where we're going to store our movies. And these are going to be dictionaries like so. And then down here, we've got our menu with pass statements instead of the actual code that we want to run. So let's start off by creating the different functions that we're going to need. So here we've got some hints. You may want to create a function for this code and create other functions for listing movies and finding movies. So we're going to start off by doing that. So we're going to do add movie like that. And we're going to put this code inside it. So there's our first function. Now we're going to create the other functions as well. And I'm going to use pass just temporarily before implementing these functions. So here we've got our two other functions that don't do anything at the moment. So I'm going to delete this comment. It's common in Python to leave two lines between function definitions just to give yourself a bit more room to read the code and make it a bit more readable. Now, here we've got our user menu. And we're also going to make this into a function. Just like that. And here we've left a comment reminding you that you have to run the function as opposed to just create it. So after we've done all of this, we run the menu function. And that is what's going to start this loop here. Now, if the user enters A, we're going to run the add movie function. If they enter L, we're going to run the show movies. And if they enter F, we're going to run find movie. This is really what's going to happen in our application. This is the main application logic. Now we have to go ahead and implement these functions that allow us to show movies and find movies. 
When it comes to adding a movie, all that we're doing is asking the user for the data we need or the application needs, and then appending that as a dictionary to our list. So every time we run the add movie function, we'll presumably end up with one more dictionary in our list. So how are we going to show these movies to the user? Well, here's an idea. We'll iterate or use a loop to go over the list. That will give us a dictionary for each element in the list. And then in that dictionary, we will get the details, title, director, and year for each movie. So let's do that. We'll do four. And here we're starting our for loop. Now we tell Python the variable that we want to use as we go through this loop. This variable gets created and used as each element in the list. And that is signaled by doing in movies. So for movie, in movies, we create this movie variable and that equals the first element of the list. When we repeat the loop the second time, then movie is the second element of the list and so on. And here what we're going to do is we're going to do print movie and we're going to pass in this movie variable as an argument. Of course, this print movie is a function as well. And we know that because we've got the brackets after the name. Therefore, we have to create this. And the reason we're doing that in here is because we're going to use this function in two places. So it's a good practice to create functions in order to reduce code duplication, because we're going to use it here and also here later on. So we have to define this function. We'll do print movie, and this takes in an argument. So it has a parameter, which I'm going to call movie, but you can call whatever you want. This is a new variable that gets created when this function runs. And in here, it's going to have the value that this had at this point in time. So here, this is going to be a dictionary from our list. And what we're going to do is we're going to print the title is going to be movie title. And that is going to give us one line of text saying title colon space and the movie title or the title property of this dictionary. Something important to notice here when using F strings and accessing dictionaries inside this interpolation statement is that you have to use different types of quotation marks. So here I'm using double quotation marks on the outside, single quotation marks on the inside. If you don't, then Python is going to think that you are terminating the string and it's going to get very confused. So make sure to do that. Now that we've done this, we can do the same for the other details of the movie. There we go, we've got the director and the release year, and we're printing those properties out. Make sure to spell these properties correctly, otherwise you're going to get an error when you try to access a property of a dictionary if the property doesn't exist. All right, so we've got the show movies there. Whenever the user types L, we're going to run that function. That's going to go through the movies, and it's going to call print movie for each one, passing it as an argument. So that dictionary is going to go from here to here, and then it's going to appear here as the movie parameter, and we're going to access each of the properties as we print them out. Now let's go on to find movie. Here, we're going to go through the movies list and check whether the title of a movie is equal to something that the user is searching for. So first things first, we have to ask the user for what they're looking for. So we'll do search title is equal to, and then enter movie title you're looking for. Now that we've got that, we can go over the movies as we did earlier on, just exactly the same loop. And here we're going to include an if statement. This if statement is going to check whether the title of the movie is equal to what the user typed. And if it is, we're going to do print movie of that movie. Notice that here we're accessing the movie dictionary and we're accessing the title property of that. We're comparing it with what the user entered. If that evaluates to true, then we will execute this line here. And here we're also using the movie that we define in the for loop, but now we're passing it to this function so that it can access it and print the details out. That's about it for the project. So that implements the functions that we're missing. 
and now we can delete this incomplete app comment from the top and we can run it and see what happens so here we can add a new movie it's going to be the matrix wachowski and i think it was 1999 that it was released so that seems to work we're going to press l to see the movies and you can see that we print one of the movies out we're going to type f we're going to type the matrix and you can see that that finds the movie but if we type f and we type the matrix without the x then nothing gets printed out finally we type q and that terminates the process so this is all well and good but there is a further improvement that we can make to this menu section here you can see that we have an if statement for each different option that the user can type and that is okay when you've got three options or four options and so on but if you have 10 options then it can become a bit unwieldy so we're going to make an improvement by using first class functions remember in python all functions are first class functions but now we're going to make use of that attribute of functions so that we can simplify this code and what we're going to do is we're going to define a dictionary called user options and this is going to be the different things that a user can do in our application mapped to what they may type in the input so if they type a then we're going to associate a with add movie if we associate l with show movies making sure to delete the brackets that pycharm adds automatically and f with find movie now what we've got is essentially this if statement here uh, as a dictionary so what we'll do next is instead of doing all that we'll do if the selection is in the user options and that just means if what the user typed is one of these keys then we will get the selected function variable and we will make it user options selection that is going to use what the user typed and access the user options dictionary with that string so that we'll get for example the add movie function back and then all we have to do is do selected function and run that remember you can run a function by using the brackets finally if the selection was not in the user options that means that it is an unknown command so we will use this else that we already had there to print unknown command please try again you can see how this makes use of first class functions to simplify this code slightly by reducing the need for an if statement in a menu now if we want to add more options to our menu we just add them to this dictionary and it's pretty straightforward but if we wanted to add more options earlier on we had to go into our menu and add more branches to our if statement so hopefully all of that makes sense and you have learned something in this video regarding how we would implement this milestone project remember if you compare your code to ours and you're not sure about something in your own code and you want some feedback regarding the code that you've written then please ask a question in the course q a post the complete code and we'll be more than happy to help you out thanks for joining me in this video and i'll see you in the next one